My name is Pete Story. I'm the founder and CEO of um, Greenit, greenit.com, the crowdfunding platform specifically for creatives. And this is the second session of um, Green at You, which is, which is our new training and business education program for creative people. So people who, who have creative skills and film, be that filmmakers, be that theatre makers, be that musicians, people with something to say about the world. And one of the learnings we've had running a crowdfunding platform is that creative people often have a lot of gaps in their knowledge when it comes to business. And it should never be somebody else's job to do stuff. You know, a little bit of knowledge can go a very, very long way. And the more you understand, the, the more rounded you can be as an artist and the more likely you are to get your stuff made and make that sustainably. So last week's session was an introduction to marketing, which was some, some concepts and principles around what it means to market your work. Um, that is available on our YouTube channel. It's also embedded on... Uh, greenlit.com slash you and that's the, the letter U and hopefully you know there, there'll be some things to take away there in if, if you get the opportunity to watch that I'd, I'd be delighted and we have a full program coming up as well so in two weeks from now which I believe is Wednesday the 13th we have our Greenlit team member Sierra, Sierra Callahan. she'll be talking about social media as a tool for, for your creativity and for marketing and promoting your creative work. Uh, Sierra is a filmmaker, an actor, writer, and she's also a TikTok star with half a million followers for her Ask a Science Teacher channel, where she does what it says on the tin and, and responds to questions people write in very quickly in a 30 second blast. Um, so very successful on TikTok, very good educator. So that's a great session. Watch our usual channel, sign up in the usual way for doing that. We also have coming up some sessions on film festivals, on how to plan your festival strategy and secondly, how to practically prepare to attend a festival. Uh, we have a session coming up on pitching. Uh, universal skill that everybody often overlooks and we also have a very exciting and very interesting session coming up about claiming tax credits for your creative work and and how that works from the county's point of view so stay tuned to our channels you're on the mailing list we've got you now uh, we'll send you reminders but please i would love for you to join us and to help us build the experience so the stuff you want to learn about stuff that's missing from your your business knowledge and insight Share that with us via the form, ping us. Um, you know, I'm Pete at greenlit.com. Phil, here is Phil at greenlit.com. Um, we, we really want to make this work for the community. We're trying to do something a bit different. And, you know, as you can see, it, it's not the busiest of seminars right now. But if you find this useful, please, please, you know, tell people about it. Because the more feedback we get, the more impetus we get going, you know, the, the more involved we can become and, and the better the sessions that we can produce. So that's a broad outline of, of what we're doing at Greenlit U and also obviously Greenlit, the crowdfunding platform. Come and hit us up if you want to talk crowdfunding. So tonight, a very special session indeed. Um, and this one will be run by Phil Melanson, who is our head of communications here at Greenlit. Uh, Phil was formerly a digital publicist, a digital marketing manager with Sony Pictures in Los Angeles and very, very experienced within the scene um, in all kinds of genres of film marketing and most recently was working on projects such as Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and uh, Little Women. Uh, Phil, luckily for us, came to the UK to study creative writing and joined us after graduating. And what Phil doesn't know about these subjects and the subject of how to build a brand and how to be a personal brand, it's not worth knowing. So this, this is gonna this is gonna be a fantastic session. Um and really you can you can send it two ways. I know uh, Jack Danner doesn't have a mic, um, but you can just ping us in the chat. I guess that I think the format is is Phil's got some prepared stuff. Is that that's right, Phil? And then yes. we'll we'll get into QA's at the end. So if you want to talk about stuff that's specific to you, uh, let, let's do it. You know, it's a nice intimate room. So Let's let's roll with it. So I'm going to hand you over with no further ado, Phil Melanson. Uh, take it away. Um, that was a, a very uh, kind intro. Um, you kind of you know you, you you kind of stole my intro from me um, in a good right. way. So uh, you know I you know I came to Greenlit having worked um, for about six years uh, in Hollywood in film marketing. So uh, jumping from film campaign to film campaign. 
um, as Pete mentioned, from Little Woman to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which is definitely a career highlight, but also some films that were less successful. Um, you know, when you work for a big studio, you get the the full run of the mill from, you know, big budget blockbusters to tiny horror movies to just some like, you know, some not great movies out there too. Um, and I think through that process, it really was a great education in how to quickly establish a brand and quickly communicate that and how valuable a tool that can be both for just yourself as a creative individual, but also for any creative projects you may have. So that's what we're diving into today. And now I'm going to switch to screen sharing. So we're talking about branding today. Um, and we have already introduced ourselves. You, you know, Pete introduced me. I'm Phil. Um, so we're going to just hop right into things. I wanted to start with two examples here. Um, just, to, I think, to communicate the, you know, what ability uh, branding has. So this goes back about, I think, 10, uh, maybe 12 years now, Drive, um, which was an excellent film. Um, you have two very different posters here for it. Um, so one on the left is actually its DVD release in the United States. The poster on the right was its American theatrical poster. Um, in the chat, if anyone feels like offering, because um, I do, I would love this to be a very interactive session, you know, let me know if you have a preference as to which one you prefer, because I know I certainly do, which is why I included these two. Um, they're obviously communicating very different things. Um, you know, both of them have a car in them. So we, you know, we know it's a movie probably about a car, you know, the, the, also the title is Drive, you get your talent, Ryan Gosling there, um, in, you know, very prominent placement. But I think the difference here is really like an established brand identity versus something that feels more generic. So I, you know, you feel free to disagree, but I would say, you know, the close up on the right, you know, you really get his face, um, you get a sense of tension. And I would also point out just like, just the text on this. So the one on the right, which is the theatrical poster, um, great tagline, there are no clean getaways. Um, and then the title treatment, which is the kind of the fancy film lingo for the, you know, the film's logo, if you will. Um, very distinctive here, very retro, very 80s, which is very on brand with the film, which is hyper stylized, um, very much like a, you know, kind of an auteur driven film. Um, and so, you know, that really speaks to a specific film and gives you a taste of what you can expect. Um, whereas the one on the left, I would say, you know, it perhaps it feels has a broader appeal. It's less artsy. Uh, but at the same time, I think it loses a sense of what makes it special. So let's dive in a bit more and understand why those differences are there. So I think it's helpful to just start with, you know, some definitions on branding. Uh, if we look at the Oxford English Dictionary, they say that it is an application of a trademark or brand to a product, the promotion of consumer awareness of a particular brand of goods or services. Um, but I would say the American Marketing Association has a more relevant definition. What they say is that a brand is a name, term, design, symbol, or any other feature that identifies one seller's good or service as distinct from those other of other sellers. And I bolded distinct here because I think that's a really fundamental component of what makes for branding. Uh, you know, you are really trying to differentiate yourself from competitors. And Pete in our last session talked about how in creative projects, you don't necessarily want to think, uh, you know, there's a reluctance to think of your creative work, whether it's a film, a, a play, um, a piece of music as a service or a good. Um, but in the, you know, if you're putting your marketing hat on, you sometimes have to um, think about it that way. And so really what we're trying to say is how can you make your project or yourself as a filmmaker or creative distinct from everyone else? So to dive into that, um, you know, we're going to talk through some attributes of a good brand. Um, now I know we're relying on chat here, so I'm just going to dive into the examples, but if anyone has any other thoughts, um, please throw them out. I think there are three main pillars to what 
really makes a good brand. And that is it's distinct, as we saw in that definition, that it's memorable um, and that it's clear. Anyone drop it in the chat? Can anyone think of some brands that stand out as particularly good or exemplary of these three traits? Um, I'll throw out one and say Nike. I, I think it might be like the best brand ever. Um, you know, everyone knows it just by its name. Everyone knows the swoosh logo. Everyone knows just by seeing the tagline, just do it, that it's about Nike. Um, at the end of the day, they're just making trainers. Um, DC, Jolene said in the chat, absolutely, I agree. They have a very strong brand identity too. Um, I think that is why we've seen such success with, um, you know, with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, with the DC films, you know, they have such a strong brand and that also oftentimes translates to a very strong fan base, um, which then translates to strong ticket sales. Um, and so, you know, I think we can also apply these ideas of what is a good brand to films as well. So, you know, something, we'll see it later, but a film like Jurassic Park, it's distinct, it's memorable, it's clear. Really, we want all films or creative projects to be these three things. Um, I think we can apply it to individuals as, as well. You know, I don't think the Kardashians would be as famous as they are today if they weren't distinct, memorable. I mean, clear is maybe not so applicable here, um, but they know, you know who their audience is. They know how to communicate that clearly and they know how to differentiate themselves from other people in a similar space. And so on the flip side, I think it's good to talk about perhaps what are attributes for a weak brand. And I know I've been using the labels good and weak um, and talking about branding, but I really think that comes down to what we remember and what we don't remember. Um, I think that's really the, the most deadly thing for a brand is that, is that it's just plain forgettable. Um, I would also argue if it's derivative. Um, and this, I think, is a really important thing to keep in mind in the, you know, in the creative space with films, with, with music, with theater, because we see a certain look or a style trend, and sometimes there is the instinct to lean into it or to mimic it. But oftentimes that can dilute a brand, make it feel very much like a copycat. And I think that can really be, it can be a way to really you know, pull down the quality of your film, because I believe that everyone on this call as a creative person makes really great projects that are distinct. Um, but in, in branding it, if you are not putting in that extra 110% to make it really stand out, you run the risk of making it seem like it's less original than it is. I would also argue if your brand um, or how you're communicating it is overly complicated, that can also really harm you as well. Um, you know, this is why I think filmmakers are trained to have a log line for their film, have an elevator pitch. You want to be able to understand and distill your project to, you know, a simple tagline, a simple sentence. Um, if it is too complicated, it's going to be hard to translate and make that resonate with an audience. Um, and I think that's especially true online. We're really going to have an online focus for the session today because I think that's really where, especially for independent filmmakers, our, our brands are initially launched. Um, but I also think this translates to even theatrical releases. There have been some brilliant films out there that just because they, the marketing teams, and I'm going to point the fingers at the marketing teams because I used to be on one, if they can't find the right messaging to distill a, you know, a complicated story, sometimes they just can't make it resonate with the audience. So moving on, why is, why do we care? Why is branding important? Um, yes, Malignant was brilliant, but didn't, you know, you don't, don't see much marketing. That, you know, it is a real problem. Um, and, you know, oftentimes when you work in marketing, people joke that, you know, it's, it's the, the problem is not the marketing, it's the quality of the film or the script. Filmmakers will point at marketing and say, no, it was a poor marketing job. The truth is like, it's a little bit of everything. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really tough out there today. And I think especially in such a digital centric world that we're in right now, there's so much clutter in terms of what's on Instagram what you're seeing in your feed as you're scroll scrolling through. So to differentiate yourself, I think is all the more important. Um, and to also be able to distill that message. 
Um, so you know, I kind of just answered my own question, why is good branding important? Um, I think more than anything, it's helpful to think of branding as just a way to communicate. Um, I think we get obsessed in like look and aesthetic and the idea of like beautiful branding or like a very eye-catching logo or something that feels trendy. But in the end, it's just a way to more effectively and simply communicate what your project is, who you are, for instance, you know, someone like a Kardashian, they're able to, you know, effectively convey their personality because they understand the fundamentals of who they are as a brand. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there is a difference between you as a person and your brand. Um, to take a step back, you know, branding helps com communicate who you are or whom you'd like to present to the world, crucially, um, what your project is about, so its storyline, also what genre your project is, down to the font choice, like that very much tells an audience to brace themselves for a horror project or a drama or a romance. Um, branding is also a way to grab attention. Uh, you know, there are so many films out there, as you know, when you're scrolling through Netflix, you know, and sometimes those thumbnails don't stick out particularly much. Um, and Netflix is actually doing a very, very interesting experiment that the thumbnails that I'm presented for Netflix programming and Netflix films are different than the ones you're getting presented with. And it's all based on a very complicated data algorithm and I find that fascinating but at the end of the day you know whatever imagery is out there it has to grab attention um, or I'm gonna you know just kind of swoop by it. Good branding also is what makes you and your work unique um, you know your work is unique but it helps convey that um, you know you don't want to just be Times New Roman default font you know unedited photo you want to you know, especially in a digital space, present the most unique and characteristic version of you and your work. We should talk about this. So I'm talking about branding for projects, but also branding for yourselves. And I very much believe that creatives should have more than one brand. And truthfully, anyone that needs to present their work in an online space, um, whether you're a social manager for a corporation, whether you run a small business, you know, you need the brand for yourself as a person, but also the brand for your work. And so we're gonna talk through some of those differences there. Um, you know, there's some correlations, but I think you really need to have different approaches for yourself and for your project. So a personal brand should tell who you are. And I put you in quotation marks here because it may not be the true you. You know, in a digital age, you're allowed to put on a persona. Um, and if there's one thing I really want to stress here, I, you know, if you're not comfortable sharing every little detail of your life on online, don't, um, you have to do what works and feels right for you. Um, and for some people that means offering a, a slice of their life. Um, you know, celebrities are very good at this, at, you know, showing a, you know, a small slice of their existence. You know, there are some things that are public, there are some things that are private. I think a personal brand can also evolve. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about how important it is to be consistent, especially when talking about, you know, a project or creative brand. But you as a person, you, know, you don't have to stick with the same font. You don't have to stick with the same photo type. Um, more than anything, leading into the next point, you just need to seem authentic. Um, and I, I truly, like, I kind of hate this word right now. It's very trite, it's overused, but I do think it speaks to something that we're craving in all of you know this junk, frankly, that so many of us are seeing online in terms of what we're following and you know, very curated and things that just don't, that feel false. And I think people are really good at sniffing that out now. Um, you know, if you are using, Ah, you're jumping ahead of me, Jolene. Um, so a CTA is a call to action, um, which means, um, you know, it, uh, essentially, an you know, urging someone to do something based off of a um, a post. So, for instance, if I'm advertising a movie and I post, um, a, you know, I post a trailer. Usually, the trailer will have the film and essentially in not just the release date but it will say like you know see it in cinemas 
see it in cinemas is that call to action. Um, it can be just asking your, your followers to follow you to, you know, to con contribute to a crowdfunding campaign. Um, I think it's a very important part of posting, especially from a project standpoint that oftentimes I think first time marketers, if you will, often overlook. Um, to talk, you know, to continue personal brand, I think it's all about building community. Um, and I think that really ties into authenticity. You really wanna feel like you're interacting with the people following you, um, that you're sharing a, you know, a true sense of yourself or your persona. Um, and you, know, you want to, and this is where I think call to actions are more minimal for a personal brand because you, know, you don't wanna just seem like a business. If you as a filmmaker, wants to share your, you know, your process in terms of finding your next project or writing your next screenplay. You don't need to encourage people to follow you. You don't need to prematurely um, encourage them to support your crowdfunding campaign. There is a time and a place for that, and we'll talk about that. Um, but I really think on a personal level, people are just looking to follow a story, which is yours. Project-wise, um, flipping to the right side of the screen, you know, um, you're not telling who you are here, you're telling your story. And I think it's really important, as I mentioned, to focus on that log line, to have a concrete Twitter friendly length, um, you know, summary of your film. And I think it's very important to have that super polished. I think this is, this is to me as like someone who really loves their grammar. Um, I think this is the thing that really hurts me the most is seeing someone put so much effort into making a great distinct film and then just not putting in the extra little bit of effort when it's done to put together a really good branding kit and to you know to con communicate their film in a clear way and this means everything from the the font choices used you know you don't want to be unless you're doing a comic book you don't want to be doing comic sans or papyrus you know we've heard all these fonts that people hate um it, maybe you're using it ironically and that's cool um but your film deserves more than just like a default font um and likewise like your you know your social posts shouldn't be liter you know shouldn't have typos like these things matter um and i also think consistency matters when it comes to a creative project um you know unlike you as an individual, your project is not so much evolving by the time you're talking about it on social media. You might be presenting, you know, its evolution into coming on screen, but the project at that point should not be changing dramatically. And so, and even if it does, even if your film drastically changes in the edit, people online don't need to know that um, unless you want them to. Um, but I think it's good to be consistent because you want, to target a specific audience, you want to have a consistent look, and you want people to be able to identify, see those signals, and respond to it. Because um, if you keep changing, your audience is going to change too, and that's going to make it tougher for you to really have a community that carries through your whole campaign and on to the next project as well. And I also think, in terms of goals, um, you know, whereas building a personal brand, you're focusing on community. When it comes to a project or a creative brand, you're really trying to build awareness. There might be more specific goals, like you know, you might be running a crowdfunding campaign, and you you know you have a very concrete twenty thousand pound goal on that campaign. But you also just might be trying to build awareness for the fact that you have a film, and it may not have a distributor yet. It may not be in festivals yet. No one might be able to see it, but they know that it's coming. I think that's important to really bake in early on so that you have people engage with the story of your project getting made. Um, and then I put constant CTAs or calls to action because I think they are very important. Um, you don't need them on every post, but if you are promoting a project, it's just very, very helpful. And they, that's not to say one call to action for an entire project. It may be at one phase to just follow along. It may be to read an interview. It may be to vote for you in a like um, you know a people's choice festival. Um, it can evolve with the needs of the project, but letting people know what they can do it's very helpful. But there are two things I think in common, and they're at the bottom here. So regardless if it's your personal branding or the branding for a creative work, 
you want it to be unique. And more than anything, the end goal is really getting people invested. Um, sometimes that might mean financially, but really I just mean emotionally. Um, you want them to be interested in both you and your creative work. So to dive in a bit more in how you build a personal brand, you know, I really think people tend to overthink this, um, and I think it's good to go into it with some strategy, but it's really about finding a method that works for you. So building a personal brand, I think you really got to find a method that works for you. And so, um, you know, you want to build upon your interests. You want to connect with people. Um, you don't have to fake engaging with content that is not relevant or not interesting to you. Um, this, I think, is a, a real mistake that people make. You know, Twitter has its trends. People feel like they have to respond to everything. You know, everyone this week is talking about the slap. If that's not relevant to you, don't talk about it. You know, frankly, I'm tired of hearing about that at this point. Um, you know, really, if you have a in a take, if you will, if you if it is of personal interest to you, then yes, engage with it. Um, but you know, just because it's online, just because it's a headline doesn't necessarily need, mean that you need to react to it. Um, and also this also means you don't need to be posting every day. If that's what works for you, if you are just someone who loves tweeting the minutia of their life, go for it. But if you're someone, I, I, that's not me. Um, if you're someone who just likes to, you know, post occasional nice landscape photos, do that. At the end of the day, it shouldn't feel like homework. It should be what matches your personality. And that's why I say use a method that works for you. And so I've included a bunch of logos here. So there's the obvious ones, you know, Instagram, probably, you know, the one that people default to thinking of now. There's TikTok, which is the, you know, I'm going to sound old here by saying hot new thing. Um, and Sierra next week, who is legitimately a TikTok influencer, her account is Caligan's Questions. Um, she will much more effectively talk about social management. Um, because, you know, I personally, and that's not me, um, and I think she's fantastic at it, so really look forward to that session. Twitter, YouTube, there are different ways to use these platforms, and I think that's what's really interesting. Um, but I've included a few others here. So there's Substack, which is a newsletter service. Um, started in the States, I believe they just really kicked off their UK operations earlier this year, but it's like a MailChimp, but frankly, less of a hassle, and it's free. Um, and it's really a way to have a blog, um, but have it land in people's inboxes. And that might mean friends and family. It might mean strangers, depending on the type of content you're putting out there. So it has everything from like Alison Roman, who's a, you know, a Bon Appetit, former Bon Appetit and like a chef. Um, she posts recipes there. It has George Saunders, who won the Booker Prize, doing like a creative writing workshop. You know, there are ways to approach this um, that, you know, to make it fun for you. Um, and then I've also included just, you know, there's email, there's websites. My caution on this is, you know, yes, if you want to have a website, it's an important tool for some, you know, some creatives in today's world. If you're a photographer, if you're a musician, if you're a filmmaker, it can serve as a portfolio. And that's definitely important. But if you're thinking about it as a platform to just share content, you do have to think about how people are going to get there. Um, and likewise with email. So, you know, email is great for one to one contact, but at the end of the day, you're never, it's going to be very difficult to increase who's receiving your emails unless you just continue to add them manually. And so that's why for newsletters, I would really encourage looking at a newsletter service like Substack that allows you to ingest the emails you already have, but also be open to just people organically discovering whatever you have to talk about. Um, so if you're a blogger, definitely look at those because I will say like blogging is very difficult now. You know, there was that blogging boom, but now, you know, no, you know, if you put a blog on a, on a custom URL, you just have to think about how people are going to navigate there and discover that. And if you are putting in a lot of time and energy to build a beautiful website for your blog, you know, you want to make sure that investment is worth the time and that people are seeing it. So really think about also the methods of how people are going to reach and interact with your content. Now we're going to talk about building a project brand, which is a bit different. So as we talked about, you want to communicate your story, 
But I also think a really fun part about this process is that you're also communicating the story of your story. Um, and this is actually what a colleague of Pete and mine's at Greenlit Grace, she says this all the time, um, you know, when talking about running a crowdfunding campaign, you're also talking about the story of this project coming together. Um, and I think that's actually a part that people really love to see. So if you're in production or development or post on a film or creative project, definitely think about ways to share that journey with followers. Um, people love BTS content. And honestly, there's not a lot of it shared still to this day. Um, and it does not need to be the super polished creative content EPK level stuff that you see for a Hollywood blockbuster. Just you doing an Instagram live while you're on set or in a casting session or just a snapshot of the edit bay or what your avid window looks like. People love to see that. Um, and again, as we're talking about authenticity, that really does speak to a sense of authority and you know people will it will resonate with people because oftentimes you're going to have other filmmakers following you following you and they'll have been there too so really think about ways to creatively share the roadmap and process of your project coming together when it comes to a project brand make sure to have a really clear goal um this might be crowdfunding if you're running a crowdfunding campaign it might be distribution. So let's say your film is going to be on iPlayer. Um, you'll really want to promote the heck out of that um, and really let people know when it's going to be launched, how they can access it, how long it will be up there, all that good stuff. Um, this is true for festivals too. So if you've made a film and now it's going through the festival circuit, absolutely post and share with your followers how you know the film's journey and what accolades it might be winning and post those laurels you know people love to see that people love to see good news at the end of the day um and then casting as well so this is something to consider too but you know social can be a tool when it comes to you know your film being cast um in today's age so this is why i say share the story of the coming together because you might not know that an actress following you is, who might be the perfect person for a role you know she might be able to know that you're you know looking for a certain part Likewise with certain crew members, um, you know, a cinematographer might follow you and you don't have your DP yet, you know, there you go. Um, I would also say in slight contrast to a personal brand, you do want to maximize your online presence with a project, um, but only where it makes sense, I would say. So I do think it's important to be on more than one platform. Um, I would say, generally speaking, if we're talking about a short film or an independent film, you definitely want to be on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, I am somewhat surprised these days to only see people on one or the other. Um, all you have to do is, you know, download one of those free dashboards to have them post automatically anything to both platforms. Um, but you also don't need to push yourself to be on platforms where it doesn't make sense. So, you know, I think right now TikTok is very much the craze. But is it the right platform to share the, you know, the pathway of your film getting together, getting made? Perhaps, perhaps not. Don't force it if you don't understand it or it doesn't feel right for your project. Um, and, you know, likewise, Facebook, definitely one to look at as well. But, you know, perhaps it is less of a juggernaut than it used to be. So consider whether it's the best use of your time or not. Consider newsletters as well. So again, I mentioned Substack. You could make a Substack for your um, for your project. There are really fun, creative ways to approach this. All. Using a brand asset kit. So we're going to get into this in a second, but I think it's really important to have a set series of images and assets that you use when promoting your project online. How do you do that? Um, let's talk about the, the principles of project branding. You want to... It, they're really the same as what we've been talking right now. So you want to tell or share your story. You want to build upon your interests and you want to connect with people. Those assets that we talked about. I think the musts, if there's, if there's like one thing I can just put on like exclamation points for today's meeting, please for your project have a title treatment, um, which you might call a logo, but it's technically a title treatment if it's, a, you know, if it's text. Um, and please have that be a PNG file, which means it has a trans. You can have it have a transparent background. This is going to save you 
so much time and energy in the long run that you can just drop it onto a Word doc. You can drop it onto a website um, and it's just going to natural look natural. It's going to fit. It's not going to have a white box or a black box around it. Um, it can be it's it, it just so helpful. And I think it really lends a sense of professionalism um, and authenticity to your project to be able to have a distinct logo, to not just be writing your film's title in caps lock times new Roman. Um, I would also say have a key image. This is tough. I know if you're going into development or you're going into production, you might not have shot a single frame of your film yet. But if you think there's a representative image that you can come up with, you absolutely should. Um, I will go into a great example in a moment, um, but you, know, you can be creative about what a key image is. It might be a still of one of your, your actors. Um, it might be just a landscape shot. Um, if your project is very much centered around a specific place, it might be an image of that place. Um, and then other things to consider, but they're not always right for every project. You might want to have a tagline, which is different than a log line. Sometimes it can borrow from it, but it is really the marketing friendly, you know, catchy way to convey, or and it's often tongue in cheek, um, you know, convey what your project is. There's, again, there's a fun example coming. They have a great tagline. Um, credits. So if you are, you know, you get to boast about yourself um, when you're building a creative brand for yourself. So, uh, you know, don't hesitate to say you are the director of, you know, X, Y, Z previous film. Um, and also likewise with accolades. So if you are a filmmaker who has been nominated for a best director award at a film festival, definitely include that on your assets. Again, things that add a level of professionalism and authenticity to your creative work. Um, and all of this can be used to make a poster. So here is the example I was talking about. So this is a very, very simple poster when you break it down, and yet it's very iconic. Um, so all it is is a title treatment, which is the Jurassic Park text. Note that they used, you know, they used a bespoke font here, um, but likewise, you could find something similar for your project. Um, but it gives a very clear look and feel to this film. Then there's the key image. So this is a rare movie poster that has no, you know, no imagery of the actual film itself. So this film could have, this poster could, could have gone out before the film even started production. But it immediately tells you it's about dinosaurs. Um, and then a tagline, which this is just some great marketing, I have to call it out, like an adventure 65 million years in the making. So it's fun, it's tongue in cheek, it's a little meta, we love it. Um, you know, all those things together, slap it on, slap it on a back background and you have truly like one of the best movie posters of all time, really. Um, I also wanna call out the billing block um, at the bottom right hand corner, because I get this question a lot. Um, Oftentimes people feel like they have to add a billing block to a poster, which is, you know, this very narrow, slim text that's at the bottom um, that has the distributor, it has the talent, it has the director, the writer, the producer, um, it has the rating bug, the, you know, PG-13. You do not need to have this, probably. Um, billing blocks are a legal requirement. It, this is, it is literally just to satisfy the legal team. Um, you know, when Steven Spielberg goes in to make a film, he gets something called top billing, which is why above the logo, you see his name, a Steven Spielberg film. And likewise, the order of the cast names, you know, the fact that, um, you know, Sam Neill becomes before Laura Dern, that is stuff negotiated as a part of the, you know, talent being casted in the film, which matters if your film is getting distributed but if that's the case, the distributor is going to take on this very annoying and convoluted process. You personally do not need to worry about that if this is just for your personal brand, for a project that you are either self-distributing, that you're putting through the festival circuit. Um, if you like the look of a billing block and you wanna do it, go for it. 
I will say it just, you know, it's one of those things like people expect to see it. So it kind of looks professional at the same time. It's also, a you know, as we've talked about, it's somewhat unnecessary. So um, I wouldn't get worked up over it. You know, I'd rather you, know, you focus on having a great key image, a great title treatment. So to talk about some more elements of a brand asset kit. Sorry, Pete, you're getting a little cameo here. Um, <laughs> uh, to use, you know, what we're bringing you today, Greenlit, um, as kind of, you know, examples for fundamental asset building. The title treatment is just, you know, Greenlit in a very specific font, um, you know, because it's bolded, because, you know, the kerning's slightly tighter. Um, because again, it's a PNG. So as you can see, it's on the nice transparent background. So it, you know, nicely fades into the slide background I have here. Um, you know, that is all you need. Uh, it, it's really simple. And then another thing I would recommend for everyone to have is a great profile image or avatar. Um, generally, this is 500 pixels by 500 pixels. Um, and you will want to put this on a light, on a white or black background. Um, and so this is why having that PNG is important because it allows you to drag it and then add any color background you'd like. Um, so this is just something that you want to be able to be immediately identifiable on Twitter if you're scrolling through so you know um, which account is posting. I would also say I would lean for images there unless you have a very, very short film title like us um, or raw, you know, it's going to, it's going to be very, very hard, especially on a mobile phone to see, you know, uh, a full title for a film. So think about a key image instead. Social banners, very important as well. So if you really do want that level of professionalism for your, you know, your online presence, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter all have placement for profile headers. Um, dimensions vary. Oftentimes, this is just a combination of assets you already have. So as you can see here, you know, the greenlit title treatment plus the logo, drop it on a nice landscape banner, and there's your header. It's just another opportunity to get your brand out there. And then video thumbnails. These are really important, and I think people often overlook them when sharing, you know, content from a film and production, especially on YouTube. Um, ultimately, this is what people see when they're scrolling through, and it's going to make it's going to be what encourages them to click. So you might have the best trailer ever cut for your short film, but if it, you know, oftentimes films start on a fade in from black, you know, if you have a fade in from black thumbnail, no one's going to want to watch that. And so, you know, just find a way to summarize what you're showing people very briefly. So this video thumbnail, which is coincidentally for our last Greenlit U session, you know, has a nice screen grab, has very clear text saying what it is. And some other useful asset types that are worth considering. So if you really are building out a robust campaign for yourself, things to consider are countdowns, um, you know, assets that are in brand for you, you know, counting down the days to a specific event, whether it's the number of days left in your crowdfunding campaign, the number of days until you drop a trailer, the number of days until you release in theaters. Announcements, you know, obviously you want to post when you have good news. So whether it's casting, whether it's that you've locked a distributor, whether it's, you know, you're now streaming on Spotify, all of those things are worth sharing. But I would encourage you to come up with a graphical way to present that rather than just writing out text. Date specific content. Um, if you are really trying to, I would say like if, if you're in the distribution period, um, it's a great way to capitalize on existing online chatter. So, um, you know, if you have a Christmas film, obviously you want to kind of capitalize on the Christmas window in terms of social. So, um, you know, certain shopping holidays, you know, all that good stuff. Um, but also even just if, if there's a relevant way for your project to connect with, you know, uh, Guy Fox Day, then do it. Um, but if it doesn't feel right, like if, if you're if you're doing a horror film that's set in the, you know, the Paleolithic, if, if you're doing Jurassic Park fireworks, you know, that that doesn't go together. So just just be logical about how you're doing it. 
um, review and accolade graphics, you know, we and character graphics. So character graphics just give people a glimpse of who is in your project. Um, so it can be focused on the actors, but I think a great, great ways to actually showcase who the characters in your film are, because those are the, you know, the vehicles that people connect with the most. Um, so tell us who your character is, um, you know, show them in action, um, just give people a glimpse of who are the characters in your film that you're making. Um, and then review and accolade graphics, absolutely. So if you are, you know, getting quotes from press, um, if you are doing screenings and you have audience pull quotes, use them. If you get any sort of laurels from any festival, absolutely put that on there. People want to celebrate you. Um, and another thing to consider, social videos. Again, if you are sharing video content of your project in feed, especially on something like Instagram, you really don't want to go over 15 seconds. The shorter, the better. I know it is like painful as a creative to cut your work into 15 seconds, into 10 seconds, into six seconds. But frankly, the shorter is going to be get you the best engagement. Um, and then memes, it may not be right. I would caution, don't make it forced. But if you feel like, especially if you're working on a comedy film um, and there's a way to capitalize on conversation that's already happening online, sure, go for it. How do you build this all? Um, you know, this is a question I get a lot. And the thing I really want to communicate here is that you do not need to be a graphic designer. Um, I do not have that background at all. Um, you know, I took maybe like one college, I mean, one class in university, that was it. Um, you know, people often think, oh, you need to know Photoshop or InDesign. You know, frankly, those are very expensive programs. You know, Adobe does charge quite a hefty monthly fee now to use them. And if you have that level of expertise and you are comfortable with the cost, you know, they are the best in class platforms. But also there's Canva which frankly is what this deck is being presented in right now. And Canva, a lot of the basic functionality is free. And I really will like, you know, I will give Canva some pre free promo right now because Canva is very smart at baking in templates for everything I've talked about here. So if you're building a social logo, they have a template for that. If you want an Instagram post, they have a template for that. Stuff like Facebook, profile covers and Twitter covers, they have all of those templates ready so that you don't need to worry about getting the dimensions right. Um, it's a really easy to use platform. Um, you can just go to canva.com um, and it, it makes beautiful decks as well. So all of what I've said also applies for pitch decks as well. So, you know, especially when you're pitching, you get one shot and we'll have a future session on some of the fundamentals on pitching, but you know, likewise, as you want to be buttoned up in terms of how you're doing your elevator pitch, you want the look of that elevator pitch and that pitch deck to feel the same. So I just feel like I've talked for so long. Um, but, you know, now's the time for questions. And I'm going to start with Jolene because you asked first. So you mentioned that you are writers, but you're starting um, an LTD company to make films, theaters, and screenings under the names Jack's Lantern. Would that be a project rather than ourselves as writers? Thank you. Um, you know, I would say it'd be helpful to establish a Jack's Lantern account and presence separate from your own. And this, I, I would also say when it's in its early stages, it's okay for the lines on those to, you know, to be a little fuzzy. Um, and I think the best way to do this is just to share content from one to the other. Um, you know, it's really the number one way if you have, let's say you have a thousand Instagram followers on your personal account and you're starting a Jack's Lantern, you know, business account, start sharing posts from Jack's Lantern onto your personal account. And that way you can migrate some of those people over to this new account. But ultimately there probably will be a phase where you want to be able to post about something so, you know, personally, but it's not right for the brand and vice versa. And that's why I think it is helpful to establish a separate account for your company. Um, and likewise, it's, you know, it's a place to showcase your work. And sometimes, you know, if you have family following your personal account, they'll, they'll oftentimes want to see some of your work, but sometimes not. So it's a great way to just set some boundaries for yourself as well. Um, 
any other questions, please drop them in the chat or, you know, if you want to take your mic off, you can, but, you know, no, no pressure whatsoever. And Jolene, if you have any other questions, please, please ask as well. Pete, if you have any questions, go for it as well. Um, I should say we do, we will be sending around this PDF afterwards. So I know there were some specific um, sections to that and, you know, you'll be able to reference this after today's session as well. Yeah, so thank you, Phil. I mean, that was a terrific session. I was sat here learning stuff as well. And it was very complimentary to, to the, the session I delivered last week. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was, that I have to communicate to, to creatives over and over again, is that marketing is not something that's tacked on to your project. It's actually, you know, so much more about an authentic expression. It's, it's almost like a bit of a language understanding the language and the syntax that you use to communicate the important essential emotional truth that, that are all at the, the you know the, the, the core of, of what you're trying to express how do you think that translates in, into what you've been talking about today and, and branding I think you're entirely right that it is the you know it's not you know I as much as I say put your marketing hat on it's a fundamental part of what your project is because at the end of the day, very few people are going to see your project without seeing the marketing first. Oftentimes it is the very first way people interact with a project. Um, and this is true whether it's a short film or whether it's a Hollywood blockbuster. Um, and I think that is why it is so crucial uh, to you know, really have a consistent and clear message and also one that matches the quality of your work. You know, this is again, it's the thing that that bothers me the most is that, you know, you know, we, especially at Greenlit, we see a lot of great film projects come in and some are looking for distribution, some are looking for money to finish editing. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they have stuff already shot and it looks so, so great, um, but they don't have any marketing assets yet. And so, you know, when I go to do the social calendar <clears throat> for Greenlit, um, you know, sometimes we, we, we struggle to, to find something to post about them. And so you wanna make it also, easier for your your partners and your collaborators and you know perhaps your eventual distributors to be able to share about you as well and you know i think it just makes you look all the more professional if you if you establish that marketing alongside instead of on top of your creative project yeah um, absolutely I, I couldn't i couldn't agree more and it's just you know uh, it's just being able to express your ideas very succinctly and very quickly so people get them. You know, it's it's a bit like the elevator pitch, uh, you know, in which, you know, you've got three sentences to to grab. I was going to say Harvey Weinstein, but maybe not him, maybe somebody else, some other dude. Um, Jeff Goldblum. I, I once shared an elevator with Jeff Goldblum. You've got three sentences to grab Jeff Goldblum's attention. Um, and nothing changes. You know, you're not doing anything superficial. You're not adding anything. You're just learning to express what do you have to say very, very succinctly to, to fit that context? And I think branding is, is as we've learned from Phil, is, is very much that. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. Um, I think we have a question from Jolene in the chat. Um, Jolene says, uh, I don't like Facebook, but which platform would you recommend for film production marketing, Facebook or Instagram? Absolutely Instagram. I, I, like, I agree with you. I, I don't love Facebook right now. Um, and I, I, I would argue that people are definitely spending far less time on Facebook. Um, here's the great pro trip, Jolene. If you wanna have a Facebook presence as well, there's an option that whenever you post something on Instagram, you can share it to Facebook as well. So you don't even have to think about um, maintaining the Facebook. You can just do that from Instagram um, and there you go. Uh, I would say, you know, consider just having a Twitter presence as well, um, especially if you are building up a company you just even it's as simple as squatting on the account that you would want as well um you know as you know you never want to get to the point where you you know you have this great production company but someone else has your twitter handle that you eventually want one day so grab it from now and you know take time to figure out how to best use it um but off yeah um and Jolene now says, I don't really get Instagram. Oh I'll start learning it. No one does. There's not, a, there's, I, I, you know, Jolene, I would say there's nothing to get. It, it's a, you know, make the platform work for you. So, you know, it's a visual platform, which is great for film projects. Um, 
you know, so just, you know, really focus on the visuals there. Um, you know, it's, it's very much like the images are this big and the copy's that big. So, you know, just, just find fun visual ways to communicate the work that you're doing and you'll be just fine. Um, you know, here's the thing, like no one gets this entirely right. As much as I've said everything I've said today, you know, I've done some poor, you know, marketing in my past, you know, it, we're all learning. And I think that is actually probably one of the fun and, you know, exciting things about digital marketing is that it gives you the play, you know, it gives you the, the sand pit to experiment in. You know, if you do a post and it doesn't perform well, you can just delete it. Um, it's not as permanent as putting up a giant billboard uh, in Piccadilly Circus. Can I, can I make an observation as well? Um, yeah. I mean, you've kind of, you know, Jolene's just hit the nail on the head there because I don't get Facebook, but then, you know, I, I'm an old guy. But one of the, sorry, Instagram, uh, but one of the things that we've definitely noticed is that Facebook skews much older. So mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, it's where your parents are, it's where your grandparents are, where your aunties and aunties and uncles are. So if your brand is, you know, if you're telling stories that are, are pitched towards the grey pound or, you know, particularly for crowdfunding, if, if you wish to, dip into the pool of your older relatives uh those are the circumstances in which facebook can can be very useful if, if you're going for that older thing because you know us oldies don't necessarily grab instagram in the way that uh you know young people do it, yeah. it, it's it's as simple as demarcation as that i i agree completely i think that's a great point and i would actually that's another reason why i would say it's worth considering a twitter presence because film especially you know people talk about film twitter like you know, capital mm -hmm. F, capital T, and it really is its own entity. Um, it so it's, it's really a space where people are having conversations um, and discussions. And so I think it, it, it's a good place to be. Um, but Pete's entirely right. You know, think about the demographics um, of who's on what. And that's why I say like TikTok may not be the right place for, uh, you know, your company to be on right now, unless you're really much going after Gen Z, you know, teenagers then yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, any other questions anyone wants to jump in on the chat? And of course, if you know, I know I'm always shy to drop in questions. So if you ever want to just email us afterwards, you know, as Pete said, you know, Pete at greenlit.com, Phil at greenlit.com, please don't be strangers. We very much thank you for, you know, taking time out of your Wednesday evening. To, to talk with us today it's, it's been absolutely fantastic thank you for joining us and like i was saying at the top of the show tell all your friends about it uh you know let, let us know what we can do and what you're interested in because you know we're all about the community at greenlit we, we stand or fall by the strength of our community so any knowledge that we can share the stronger the more informed our, our community creatives is that's that's why we're here so thank thank you for joining it's been brilliant it's been grateful thank you thank you jolene Thank you, Dee. Um, we will see you for session number three.